Welcome everyone. I'm Dick Deming. I'm medical director of Mercy One Cancer Center and I'm founder of Above and Beyond Cancer. Welcome to our weekly cancer education series podcast. Tonight we're going to be talking about the healing benefits of the arts and my guest for our conversation is Pamela Crouch. Pamela, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Uh, Pamela grew up in the Quad Cities and she went to Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois, where she majored in communications and theater and music and secondary education and um, was a teacher for quite a while. Um, the reason she's our guest tonight is she uh, works at the Figgy Art Museum and, and that is in Davenport. It's in Davenport. Thank you. I have not been there, but I look forward to learning more about it. And uh, Pamela is also a four-time cancer survivor, four different primaries. So we're going to talk a bit about uh, Pamela's cancer journey and the role that the arts have played mm -hmm. in her journey and what she's doing to bring arts as a healing endeavor into the lives of others. So welcome, Pamela. Well, Hello, you gave me quite the introduction there. <laughs> and you told me that you're in your studio, and I assume that this is a studio where you create art? It is. Uh, so, I, I'm actually at my desk because I started off as a writer. And so I'm at my desk. My messy paints are that way. <laughs> so I would say maybe we start off with all the different ways in which you create art and and then after you tell us all the ways you create art then maybe give us give us a working definition for what art is i first started in the arts we'll start with that as a dancer and then as a lyric soprano classically trained lyric soprano i was also in theater and improv and so my entire arts journey at first was all in performance and then after cancer, I started picking up uh, photography. What happened was during my first cancer, I had been writing. And during my first cancer, during chemotherapy, I developed aphasia. So it was really hard to find words when I couldn't remember what a cup was. <laughs> and I literally was bald and feeling sorry for myself because I'd lost my hair. I lost my job because I couldn't write. And then it was just like, you're a creative person, figure this out. And so I started using photography because it didn't take any words. And then later I developed lymphedema because of my cancer. And I couldn't hold my camera because I really was doing a lot of macro look work, very close work with a really heavy lens. So then I thought, sure let's try something new. And I tried um, collage. I really liked that. And so then, <laughs> then um, I, I sort of started learning and teaching myself some painting and becoming very, what the heck, I've never done this before. Let's just try it. Uh, so I did painting. And then it kind of came around that after collage with my writing, I started doing assemblage. I found I like to build things and tell stories with my art. And now that I'm through my last treatment, which was in 2020, that was my last cancer was 2019. I'm back to writing and I'm working on a book in partnership with my dog, Cooper, who has been with me through all of my cancer journey and has a lot to say. So, and, and what type of dog is Cooper? Cooper is a beagle blend. Okay. And and the name of the book that you're writing with Cooper is called? Dr. Cooper's Guide to Cancer, or How I Helped My Mom Beat the Stupid Disease Four Times. Okay. And when will that come out? It should be out in July. It's grant funded. So I'm going to be able to give it away to cancer centers here in the Quad Cities and to people within a certain area uh, for free, which I'm really excited about. Yeah, wonderful. So back to the art. So you uh, uh, went through uh, sort of a, a, a litany of various ways in which you have been engaged in the 
in the arts, first with the performing arts that included mm -hmm. theater, stand-up comedy, music, um, and then photography yeah. and uh, other visual arts such as painting. Um, you talked also about uh, writing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you also mentioned at one point that you consider gardening as, as, as a uh, artistic endeavor. I do. I'm a gardener as well. And the, the act of creating and designing um, a garden can be, even if it's a, if you think about it, even a vegetable garden is very, it, it takes that creative mind to think about it. You also have to know not to plant your squash with your cucumbers. <laughs> yes. So as an artist, wh where do you think the um, healing uh, comes in in the artistic process as uh, as someone creating art. So obviously, I might go to the theater and watch art, and or go to the symphony and listen to music and be healed perhaps by that listening. But in terms of the creating of art, where where do you think the healing power of creating art comes from? I've been doing this for, well, 14 years now. It's my, been 14 years for, for my cancer journeys. And so I did some research when I started feeling better just doing art myself and different medical journals. Um, when I first started doing this, um, really the only research I could find was in Europe. And then they started talking more and more as I, as I reached out to different medical journals and, and um, looking for understanding a little bit more about why I was feeling better and why other people would feel better. And there's actually a direct medical link between creating art and the reduction of cortisol. That when you're in your brain, and I'll let the doctors talk to you a little bit more about that, but when your brain is engaged in creating art, it does reduce the stress. All of us know how stressful cancer is, um, not just for the cancer patient, but also for family members. And I will say for nurses and other caregivers, it's all very, very stressful. So we have the medical part of it, that it, there are, there's research that shows um, that, that the arts reduce stress of cancer diagnosis and very simply, when your hands are busy, your mind and heart can calm. Mm -hmm. And when when that body is calm, then you reduce your stress. You're able to think clearly. There's a lot of information thrown at people going through cancer. Sometimes you just need to get your brain changed to a different direction. And, and so um, I'm hearing you say that it's a bit like mindfulness, that... Yeah you know, uh, a mindfulness exercise might be to focus on your breath or it could be to focus on an object. And the idea is to stop the mind from just doing its monkey brain stuff of, of thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and, and getting it. And that you're using the, create, the creating of art as the focus of a mindfulness. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, if you indulge me for a minute, let's take a second and just be aware of our breath. <laughs> so many times we breathe from up here and our shoulders reach up and you're only using just a little, I'm sitting down, this little bit of your lungs. So anytime we start to feel that stress, if you put one hand on your chest and one hand lower around your belly button, and see where your breath is, that you should first feel the hand on your stomach, on your belly button, that should move first. If this one is moving, you need to really think about pushing your breath out with, to meet that hand and then lower. Think of it, think of it as an oval rather than an up and down. I do that regularly when I start even when I start to create something, I will just be aware of how I'm breathing. A lot of times, you, you know, that reptilian brain, that monkey brain, we start panting. So always think about where your brain, where your 
breath is before you start to create something, even if it's just being in the garden, if it's whatever it is that you're going to do, just slow down, make, take some breaths in, don't, don't try to keep your shoulders low, and then just out. And, and I would um, surmise that perhaps this breathing is maybe something that you have acquired as, as you do your life journey of seeking wisdom, that you've come across various ways of meditating, various ways of breathing, and, and realize that uh, even as you've been creating art, that this enhances the whole process of, of tapping into your creativity? It does. Even during chemotherapy, I would meditate. And my meditation was breathe in, I calm, breathe out, I smile. And I would do that as they were inserting the needles. And my husband would say to me, it's like, are you okay? And I said, he said, what are you thinking about? And I said, what do you mean? He said, you're smiling and you're getting chemotherapy. It was just that mindfulness. Um, and then I would color because just that simple act of repetitive coloring, uh, because I couldn't really journal. Everyone's like, oh, you'll journal during chemo. Yeah, not so much. So I couldn't remember words. Mm -hmm. So the, the coloring, the act of coloring. Are you familiar with the concept of flow? Yes. Yeah, the Mihai Chick sent me high, and uh, it's this a concept of um, it's, it's a bit about mindfulness, but it's that we can engage in mindfulness, not just by trying to sit still and count our breaths, but by engaging in an act that requires our attention. And that if we are truly engaged in an act that's involved our intent, that, that, that gets our attention, then we're not thinking about all sorts of who dissed me yesterday and the rent I need to pay tomorrow, that we are just engaged in the activity and it's amazing that you can even get flow out of a coloring book you and can. spending time filling in uh in a, in a, in a sheets of paper uh with coloring and i will be one of the classes i'll be teaching this fall for above and beyond cancer is going to be talking about using the arts and it actually kind of moves over a little bit to engaging it with the flow so yeah, great. Um, how about the uh, the act of just creating art for yourself versus the act of creating something with the intention of other people uh, viewing it, either in real time, like a live theater production, or creating a uh, watercolor that uh, is going to hang in a museum? I. It's funny because I stepped down from an executive position, executive director position, and immediately thought, oh my gosh, now I'm going to have all the time in the world to really create art and, and get it out there because I have sold art be my art before. It's like, this is my job. This is what I'm going to be doing. I was miserable because I was trying to produce art to sell, and I'm not that's not what I want to do. Um, so I backed off completely from that concept and I started just building things. My garden is full of all random things that I've been building and all of my family got homemade gifts, which brings me back to the idea of creativity. I'm a baker as well. That's creative. That is taking something, using your hands to create something. So, I, I just started painting and I started, I made a paper mache crow for a friend who likes crows. I'd never done it before. It looks like a crow. Um, so it was good. I think a lot of times we confuse the idea of using art and our creativity and having to be an artist. I have a, a very good friend who is an author but he teaches classes about writing. And he said, all of us are writers. We all text. This little thing just keeps popping up across my photo telling somebody had to write that in. They're a writer. Maybe they're not an author, but they're a writer. We are all creative. 
you have, if you're a mom and you're trying to get your kid to eat vegetables, you have to come up with creative ways to have them eat those vegetables. If you're trying to get your kids to sleep, you're creating. Uh, we all use creativity every day, but somewhere along the line, someone told us that we weren't artistic. For me, it was middle school because I'm, I have very nearsighted and I don't understand perspective. Um, and all, all, it just isn't working for me. But I was creative. I was creative in other ways. So um, when let's talk a little bit about your cancer journey because you've had four different cancers and um, you look great. I hope you're doing really well right now. Uh, I am. I am well. Yes, thank you. Good. And so your first cancer was uh, a breast cancer. Is that correct? Yes. In 2008, I had my first, I had breast cancer and we went in not quite knowing if it was going to be a bilateral mastectomy. And I said, do what you need to do. It ended up being a lumpectomy. And then two weeks later, the slide showed that I had, it had um, spread to the lymph nodes. So I had surgery again. And um, then during chemotherapy, when I lost my hair, and it used to be a lot thicker, my hair has gone through a lot. Um, but when I lost my hair, we discovered that I had melanoma on the top of my head. Would not have found that if I hadn't been bald. So we were able to just deal with that surgically. And then for 10 years, I was cancer free. And then in 2018, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And then in 2019, diagnosed with um, breast cancer, at which point then I had a bilateral mastectomy. Wow. So, so, distinct. And um, so at, at, at what point did you, did you ever become just discouraged or think that there's, um, that you're, you're taking on more than you deserve to take on? Yes, I, I, I will, you know, I have to be honest about that. I will say that having cancer in late 2019, having treatment during a pandemic, that, that was a, a lot. And um, I have a very strong faith. So that has stayed with me and guided me through all of this. A uh, very strong family. Um, but I will just keep, I, I come from a strong line of, uh, a, a, a strong line of, of, of Irish, <laughs> can you tell? Um, and my mother always had a project and always had something she was working on. And that kept me going, that if I had projects, Anytime I can be in the garden, anytime I can be creating something or doing something. But this is, this is I, when I lost my words, I couldn't perform, I couldn't act. And this last cancer, um, I don't have the strength now to sing anymore. So I'm no longer, and I'm a classically trained lyric soprano, so I no longer can sing, not even in a church choir, um, because there's just not enough, I don't have enough breath to sustain a note. Um, I couldn't act in improv uh, during some of my treatments because I couldn't remember things. So each time this has happened, I've had to reinvent myself. Each time I've had to try to find some other way to create, to, um, to find the strength um, and in, in doing that, I found different joys. I didn't know. I'm working now at, at an art museum. And, you know, years ago, I was teaching middle school. So um, we just kind of adapt and grow and change. And I think there's one area, there's some of the arts that we work on that I work with, and you don't exactly know what it's going to look like. And that's okay because we don't know it, it kind of teaches us that whatever we produce as an artist as a creative let's just use those words instead of an artist people are like i'm not an artist yeah okay you're creative as a creative there are some times when i'm baking well that pie didn't quite turn out but it still tastes good 
um, or the cookies are lopsided, but they still taste good. And if you're creating something in the arts, maybe your watercolor didn't quite turn out, then that becomes a background for a collage. So continuing so Pamela, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. Uh, can you still see and hear me okay? I can still see and hear you okay. I am okay. just double checking. It's am I off? Um, so if you, um, are on your computer and have some things that you can close down, uh, make sure you're still on the Wi-Fi because we're losing your, uh, the, the video and some of your audio. Okay. I am on, yeah, we I am still on hot. Can't hear me. Yes. Yep. I can hear you. Yes. Okay, sorry. I, I'm, I'm working on a hotspot just to make sure. And yeah. you can't see me. We, we I have can nothing see. Else on. That's just it. Okay, and so you're on a hotspot, not on a Wi-Fi. Uh, okay, yeah, it sort of comes and goes, but we we've got you right now, so we'll we'll continue here. Um, I, you, you talked about the four different cancers and I'm kind of curious, what was one of the lowest points for you in your four, uh, different journeys with cancer? And then, and then I, I also want to ask you about how, who helped you the most, uh, when you were in one of your low points? I think 10 years between my cancers, the ovarian cancer surprised me. I was not, I was just merrily going along, 10 years cancer free, and then ovarian cancer, and I wasn't expecting it. There isn't a history of it, there's no genetic reason, and that hit me the hardest. Um, which is funny because not even 12 months later, I was diagnosed with breast cancer again. Um, but during the ovarian cancer, my family, really rallied around me and supported me, um, my two kids and my husband. Um, and then my friends, we, we actually started kind of this group where we just would get together and kind of create things. Um, at that time I was working in another arts organization. And so I was able to create regularly, but I, I would say it's always been my family has been supportive of me. Mm -hmm. And uh, which of your family members has uh, been most affected by your cancer journey? I mean, I, we, we all know that the family goes through it with us and that um, everyone's a little bit different. And uh, I can only imagine um, some of the experiences that your family has had through your for cancer journeys over the course of a decade, right? Or 14, 14 years. years, 14 yeah. years, yeah. Um, my daughter was very young when I was first diagnosed and she literally didn't talk for an entire year. Thankfully, we were in a very small school and also thankfully um, the neighbors at that time just across the alley. So my daughter could just scoot over there anytime she needed to but it was a, the full year because she had the experience in second grade where her second grade teacher developed breast cancer and passed away. Oh. So yeah, so she was convinced I was going to die because that was her only experience with cancer. Uh, so I think for her, that was the hardest. Um, my son is not a fan of needles and um, I had multiple side effects during that first cancer and he would be there immediately. And then there were so many times I'd be at the emergency room and I'm like, they're going to put an IV in. And he's like, I'm not going to leave. He's like, there's a needle involved. And he was like, boof, out the door. <laughs> so 
yeah. um, and it was, it's always been very, very, it's been difficult. I mean, I don't think anyone can go through cancer and say, I was great. Um, it, it's been difficult. It's been challenging. Um, there's been so much loss of who I was, who I used to be. I still, the this, this latest loss of my voice, of my singing voice has been probably the most challenging for me. Um, and because now I feel like I sound like a little old lady, I was just kind of the hoarseness that I have and I get winded really easily. Um, but it's something that it's like, all right, well, this is the way it is. Let's figure this out. Um, mourn the loss and move on. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I keep trying to do that. Yeah. So the whole the whole process of grieving, we sometimes think, well, grief is what you experience after someone dies, but you can no. grieve over the loss of a voice. You can grieve over, you know, the loss of your hair. You can grieve over the loss of your job. I mean, yeah. grief is something that uh, it, we experience when we lose things. And for, for me, too, it was ovarian cancer and then a bilateral mastectomy. So for me, it was readjusting entirely to a new body mm -hmm. and it's something that i hadn't i wasn't prepared for um because they did just come back to back for me mm -hmm. i'm still and, adjusting <laughs> and do you ever use um your art as a way of sort of expressing that like uh you know, I certainly know of some artists that might use the loss of body parts that you might then see sort of expressed in visual arts, for example, or in uh, song lyrics uh, for those that are creative in the sense of writing their own music or their own songs. I have a piece that I completed shortly after my 2019 cancer, sorry, trying to keep them straight. Um, and it's an assemblage. An assemblage is just a collage is a grouping. Most people are very similar to that or used to what a collage is. An assemblage is you add, almost becomes a 3D piece. So the assemblage actually became, um, I have a photo of, and then I wrote a poem about some of my fears and that Jesso can't cover my scars and that my fears are exposed. So it's, there's a poem in there. And then I wrote quite a few poems um, after my ovarian cancer. I was able, I was really happy that I could do that. And so many times we don't talk as cancer patients and survivors, we don't talk about what's going on because sometimes unless you're in it you don't really understand it and for me the particular ovarian cancer i had was one that there wasn't a treatment for other than surgery so when people heard that they, they didn't hear that part they only heard that i didn't have to have chemotherapy again and they're like this is great that's wonderful yay for you and I'm like uh guys <laughs> you know it, it, just because I don't have to have chemotherapy doesn't mean that, I mean, there's a fear of recurrence. There's a fear that if this cancer comes back, it might land on something that I really kind of need to keep. Um, but there was no understanding. So I have, frankly, I have a lot of angry poetry. Um, and, and that's good. I needed to get that out. And it's still there. And I'm thinking of performing it sometime. And P Pamela, do you do you have uh, a piece of your written poetry that you could read for us right now? I don't. <laughs> I didn't okay. think about that. I'm sorry. Um, actually, it's on this computer, but I'm a little nervous with our internet if I pull anything up. Um, I'm happy to share that at at some time, um, but I don't. I I didn't have anything. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, you're, you're reminding me of um, a poem. Uh, do you know the poet Mary Oliver? I do not know. So she um, 
she died of cancer as she had survived lung cancer but she has a beautiful poem that she wrote uh, called the fourth sign of the zodiac which if you know astrology the fourth sign of the zodiac is cancer and um so i have everything on my phone so i want to just share you one stanza and then have you react to this is this is the first of four stanza in in her poem called the fourth sign of the zodiac why should I have been surprised? Hunters walk the forest without a sound, the hunter strapped to his rifle, the fox on his feet of silk, the serpent on her empire of muscles, all move in a stillness, hungry, careful, intent, just as the cancer entered the forest of my body without a sound. Yeah. That's pretty powerful. Yeah, it, it goes on and uh, has uh, different philosophical perspectives on on her reaction to having been diagnosed with cancer. And uh, maybe talk a little bit about what it felt like to, to get that poetry down on paper. And was it something that flowed kind of right directly or was it a lot of wordsmithing? Oh, no. Um, it just came pouring out. I was actually um, at an event in, um, in Iowa, and it was health and the writing. And so we had assignments, go, you know, start writing. And I had written a few things, but then that weekend, just everything came pouring out. Um, I've looked at some of it, and some of them like, okay, well, I could I can go back and, and wordsmith, as you said, um, and change some things. But the rawness, the rawness of it to me, I, I kind of wanted to keep that. And and that's that's like I said, with I'm starting to think about maybe adding more poetry and more words to my assemblage, just mm -hmm. as I am trying to work through, still continuing to work through. But then again, you know, I'll just paint random flowers on pieces of wood and stick them in my garden. <laughs> so. Yeah, it is interesting because obviously you're you're a, a very positive person and I, I get the sense that you want to portray positivity, but sometimes there is an appropriate time for anger. And oh, yeah. uh, and it sounds like maybe that that's where your anger was able to come through is in this poetry. The The anger comes through in the poetry and then the sense of loss and fear comes through in that one assemblage. But I think generally um, I express myself with my words and poetry or small short essays as far as, as the anger and the fear and the worry. Um, and that's rather than in the, in the, in the arts, um, in the visual arts, it's, it's hard to um, put into work into in for me the visuals. It's a little harder for me to be angry, as and it's easier for me to be put you know put it that anger and fear into the words. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. And fear. That's another thing that uh, you know we talk about fear of cancer coming back. And, uh, you yeah. know, in your case, it's not just crying wolf. I mean, you've, you've had four different cancers. How do you, um, when do you experience fear of recurrence, anxiety of recurrence? Is that something that just kind of pops into your head from time to time? Or what would you say about your uh, thoughts of, or anxiety or fear of recurrence? Any, for the longest what was funny was that after the ovarian prior to ovarian i was just like yeah great you know it was a bump in the road i'm good and then after the ovarian i started looking <laughs> i started like oh my gosh i've got a strange bump i should get that checked well as it turns out i did have a strange bump i needed to get it checked out and it turned out to be cancer again i'm trying to walk that line between hmm is that mole really just a mole or do I need to be concerned about it and just being able to live my life? And because fear of recurrence 
when you find a lump, when you find something, it's so real and so raw and so can be so overwhelming. So I, I try to just pause and ask myself, what can you control? What can you do? Can you do anything about it right now? What can you control? What can't you control? What do you, you know, what action items do you need to do? Because if I don't, if I start thinking too far down that road, then I get lost. And I have a fantastic medical team. And so anytime there's something, I, they're more than willing to listen to me because I don't cry wolf, as you said. Um, but it's, it's important for me to just realize when I start panicking about a lump or something else to it's like, what, what can I do right now? What can I do? And honest, I will be honest that if there's nothing I can do about it, but the worry is still there, I'll get in the garden or I'll, I'll, I'll get my hands moving. So then the brain can kind of slow down a little bit because my brain naturally just wants to move in a hundred different directions. Hmm. So if I can slow it down a little bit, it helps a lot. Right. And by slowing it down, you focus on something. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that it's not, um, in what way have you used um, uh, creative arts to help your family on, on their journey through your cancer? Because I'm sure just as you fear uh, recurrence, you know, you talked about your daughter fearing the loss of her mother because she had seen her. Uh, how have you seen um, creative arts be helpful for your family? It's interesting. My son has, he's, he builds things. But he also started, he's taught himself how to make jewelry and different things. And I don't think that he would have done that if he hadn't seen me using the arts as often. Um, my daughter is creative in so many different ways. Uh, and it's just become part of who we are as a family. Not, you know, not something that it's like, hey, let's go take some art classes. But of course, my my family will, my daughter, my, my son wouldn't go to an art class necessarily, but my daughter will go to art classes with me. Um, everybody, in, you know, we're all members of the museum. Um, my husband is actually in theater. And so for him, he is um, back on stage. Uh, he'll be in a show in July. Uh, so he's always been that kind of creative, even though he would never say he's an artist. He is a creative. Uh, he also helped me edit this book. Um, Cooper's really good at writing. He's not so good at editing. Um, and our whole family is kind of joined in on, on creating this piece with, with the dog. Um, but I think that all of them have found ways to use creativity that it, it was just it just kind of became who we are. Some, some families are just runners. Um, we just kind of became a creative family without even really thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to open it up to some questions now. So we've got uh, a live studio audience here that will have some questions. And those of you that are watching via live stream, if you could put your questions into the chat box and we will uh, copy those down. And uh, we've got a microphone here, so we will hand them to the individuals. Here we go. We got a question over here. Hi, Pamela. Um, when you create your art and as you go through the journey of creating an art piece, for instance, and it's, it sounds to me as that you start, you know, relaxing your mind and body and getting into that focus to get into that groove if you will so how do you stay in that groove and keep that focus and get everything out of the way like you know the cancer journey and your and maybe your brothers or sisters or mom and dad to i guess concentrate on that art piece or this or does that become part of the process oh thank you great question because you can't see all the mess that I have over there. I have probably four 
projects going at any one time. One of them will always be something very simple, very simple, even if it's just the coloring. Because there are times when my brain won't slow down. And so I'll need something very simple to help with that breath and just refocus it. And then there are other times when I'm working on a collage or a symbolage and I forget what time it is completely because I've become so immersed in it. Um, sometimes projects just flow really quickly and I'm able to just completely shut out the rest of the world. But there are other times that I have to always have something that it's like, don't really care what this looks like. It doesn't matter. I'm making it for me. Um, stick it in the garden. Um, I'm going to doodle. I, I have a lot of stamps. And so I will just stamp a card and color the card and then mail it off to someone. Uh, if, if the anxiety, if the worry, if the breath, nothing else is working, then I just choose a very, very simple project. I doodle a lot. Um, there's some official Zen tangling. I don't, I'm not a Zen tangle um, artist, but I doodle. I've been doodling since middle school. Um, sometimes that just helps. Just getting the pen moving and just creating shapes. Uh, but it doesn't, my art doesn't always, I don't know where I'm going to be always when I start something. Sometimes it ends up completely different. I have a lot of things that I just have backgrounds. And then later I'm like, no, oh, I'll do something else with that. Did that answer your question? Sort of. I, I, think, it, I think it does. I think it does. And I, I think that it sounds like even at the end of the process, when you have your artwork done, you have a certain amount of, of accomplishment, a certain amount of joy that, uh -huh. that you have accomplished something like that and you can share it with others. And sometimes I don't even share it with others. Sometimes I just do it for myself. Yeah, you bet. That's something that, yeah, yeah. I'm sort of envisioning uh, that you can not see your your refrigerator because it's covered with um, colorings and drawings and doodlings. Is 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 that true? Or, or... it it's full of my family's and my you know colorings right, and doodling. Right. Um, but I have a, a loft area up here in the in my studio that is pretty much jammed. And Pamela, we're you, we're losing you. We're having some technical difficulties right now. It sort of comes in waves, and uh, now I think you're unfrozen. So I, there we go. Are you still okay. able to see and hear me? Yes, I am. Okay. Do we have another question? We have another question for you. Um, do you ever have problems falling back asleep at night and your mind just goes and goes and you're creating things? And what do you do to fall back asleep? Ma'am. Um, again, still, can you hear me okay? Um, you're frozen right now. Let's just wait about 10 seconds. Uh, it kind of comes in waves. There you are. You're coming back now. So I think you can go ahead and, and answer the question. Um, yes. Yes. I wake up in the middle of the night. Um, and there's a couple of things that I do. I keep a notebook next to me with a pen and there'll be times that I'll just get that pen moving and make shapes. Um, there's other times when if I'm too tired, I literally will start envisioning what my garden is going to look like. So I want to make a meadow um, in the back of my acre. I, and that is going to take me years. So I figure I've got a few sleepless nights planning that. Um, and that helps me if I keep, if I, if I take myself out of whatever worry woke me up in the middle of the night, 
and I start to plan a garden. So whatever it is that during the day brings you joy, try to make sure you have that at your call so you can recall that at three in the morning. Um, the other thing is that during chemo, the steroids would wake me up at three in the morning, I swear. And I could only clean out the refrigerator so many times. So I'd always have a very simple art project right really close to me. Those, the, and I can't say it enough, those adult coloring books, they really help you. Um, because you're not going to get out of bed and start an oil painting. Um, well, maybe you are. But if you've got a, a notebook next to you to write lists or make doodles, or if you've got an adult coloring book, if you get woken up because of the, the medications, that does help relax you. If it's cold and you don't want to get out of bed, um, I visualize a lot. And I, that's, that has helped me. And Pamela, do you use any apps uh, for uh, mindfulness or for those situations where you want to, you know, relax, be mindful, and, and stop the chatter? Yes and no. Um, if there are times those mindful apps are fantastic. I love those. Did I excuse me? There are times when those are wonderful. There are other times when I want to throw the phone across the floor or across the room because there's like, I am not going to be calm just because you're telling me I'm going to be calm. So there are times when I use it. And then there are times when I just have to draw upon things that I've used during the day that I can, I can make my own mindfulness. Um, it, it just, it's never quite the same. It's just make sure you have enough tools in that, in your toolbox that you can pull out. And if one doesn't work, if, if the ratchet's not the right size, reach back in and maybe you need a Phillips head screwdriver. Um, sorry, can you tell I build stuff? Um, <laughs> but you need to make sure that you have options available. Available One size does not fit all with anxiety around cancer. And um, Pamela, we're gonna bring our conversations to close, but maybe the final question is, what are you most excited about uh, over the next uh, six months? I am actually looking forward to getting into the studio and just making some more assemblage or collages. I haven't really taken a lot of time. I started a new job just a few months ago and I haven't taken a lot of time to think about what I want to do with my art. Um, of course, I do have this meadow that I have to plan and, and dig and, and everything, but it's going to be really interesting. And I will also say that I'm really excited about teaching some classes for you all coming this fall. Yes. Well, I'm excited about that as well. And I can't wait to meet you in person. And I really thank you for sharing your cancer journey and also giving us a nice perspective on on the, uh, the our creativity and the role that creativity can play in healing. Well, thank you all. And please, if anybody does later ask questions, just reach out and let me know. Okay, we will do. And uh, I wanna thank everybody for attending tonight. If you know someone that would benefit by listening to this conversation, this conversation, this video podcast will be put onto the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel tomorrow. And anyone can watch it on command, on demand. And it will also be present at the Mercy One Cancer Center website. So thank you for joining us. And I hope you'll join us again next week. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>